So we just talked about densities of water. And now I want to talk about density of air. And I think we just touched on a density of air by saying one cubic foot of air weighs 0 0.076 pounds per cubic foot. Well, that's one cubic foot of air, and that's how much that weighs. And the metric equivalent of that is 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter, and that is the mass of air. Okay, is there any questions so far? We have this list. This is important, this list. And uh, any question? So I'm gonna give you a second to answer. Shaden, any question? No, your left eye is closing. I'm not sure if you're zombie or, or what's going on there. It's just, you know. <laughs> okay, so those were the densities that we um, had. We went over all of these terms and definitions, right? Um, and then we started talking about elements and we kind of figured out a little bit uh, about elements and I needed you, you to actually, you need to read about the molecular theory, the atom, the elements, compounds, and mixtures. Um, I'm not going to read those to you. Uh, and then we kind of had uh, some things about adhesion, cohesion. We talked about temperature and pressure and our standards. Remember our standards again, right? STP. We had our STP. We had 15.5 degrees C or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And our sea level pressure is at 14.7 PSI A. And while we're talking about sea level, does anybody know what elevation we are here at Calgary? Anybody? No? Oh, that didn't work. Huh. Somebody came in the room. Calgary elevation is about 3,400 feet above sea level. We're pretty high for that. Um, that's why that's why we get a lot of high-end athletes training here in southern Alberta. It's because of the elevation. Because you get less air per gulp of air, so to speak, in your bloodstream at higher elevations. So your body has to work harder at higher elevations. Another thing about higher elevations is things burn differently. That's why it's important to us, is things burn really differently. Uh, and I, I know not everybody is, I just dropped my pen. I know not everybody is, I'm back, um, an athlete, but that's okay. Um, or even a gas fitter, but things burn differently. Water boils quicker at higher elevations because there's less atmospheric pressure. Gas burning appliances burn hotter at higher elevations because of less atmospheric pressure, okay? So does anybody know Fort McMurray? Fort Mac, does anybody know the elevation of Fort Mac? Well, look, it is about 600 feet above sea level. It means as we go north, we're actually going lower elevation, believe it or not. So, Fort Mac is considered to be at sea level, and Calgary is actually considered high altitude. 
So that's interesting. And, and this will come into play um, if you're a plumber gas fitter in your third year of gas uh, or third year of your apprenticeship when you take gas, this becomes um, significant because we have to actually make sure all of our gas burning appliances are rated for high altitude in Southern Alberta. And if you want a little project to see if any of your gas burning appliances in any place that you live, but I mean, if you live in an apartment, it might be harder, but if you live in a house and you have a furnace or a hot water tank, it should be rated at high altitude because it has to be derated, derated and have a lesser input value input in BTUs for high altitudes. Well, close enough, Kristen. So 600 to 850. Listen, down in the River Valley, it's about 600 because Fort McMurray is kind of like you're driving on the road and then it's like Fort Mac is down the hill. They're really low. It's same like Calgary. Calgary, where I live, if I'm up on Nose Hill, and there's my little house, right? Up on Nose Hill, I could be 3650. So we're, we're relative, relatively close. It's still considered sea level. Anything below 2,000 feet is considered sea level. So sea level is considered from zero to 2,000. That's sea level. And then high altitude is 2000 to 4,500 is high altitude. And then above 4,500 is considered even higher. <laughs> so those are some weird numbers. Okay. Let's go over here. We talked about capillary reaction. We talked about, oh yeah, remember convex and concave? You, you need to remember what a convex is or a concave, what shape that is, right? Water is concave, mercury is convex. Concave, water is concave because of its adhesive qualities. Mercury is convex because of its cohesive properties. And then we got into doing some density equations. Um, and I'm going to actually do a couple more with you right now before I carry on. Okay, so remember this formula triangle that we use for density where M is equal to the volume times the D. M is for mass, and your mass is always in kilograms or pounds. Uh, v is equal to volume, and volume is like cubic inches, cubic feet, cubic meters. And D is for density, and density always has a mass per unit of volume, okay? Always, 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 mass per unit of volume. So let's do uh, a couple of more using this formula triangle. So I'm gonna say I have a product that has a density of one, 150 kilograms per cubic meters, okay? I want to know the volume of this object. To do that, we simply divide our density. Oh, what am I doing here? Um, no, I need another variable. Sometimes I shouldn't work off the cuff. Sometimes I... I just, one kilogram, uh, 150 kilograms per cubic meter. And I'm gonna tell you that the mass of this object is 30 kilograms 
I want to know the volume of that object. So it says up here, take the mass, divide it by the density, that should equal the volume. So I take the mass, which is 30 kilograms, divide it by the density, and I will get my volume. And my volume is going to equal 0 0.2 cubic meters. So regardless of what the answer looks like, if you put it into the equation, whoa, what the hell? If you put it into the equation of this formula triangle, you should be correct. Now, I'm going to talk about some characteristics of water, okay? Water has some crazy, crazy characteristics. First of all, it's like boiling in here. Sorry, getting a little too hot. All right, characteristics of water. So I'm going to draw an illustration here. You know, it's going to be terrible, I know, but that's okay. You've seen this already, yes? No, maybe not. Okay, I'm going to put some lines here, put some lines here, put some lines here, and then I'm just going to use a different color. So. I'm going to tell you that water is most dense. So water is dense or water is the densest, most dense at four degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Water is at its most dense, meaning it's at its most heaviest. And if you dive down into a lake, the deeper you go into the lake, the colder the water is, correct? Because that's where the cold, heavier water sits, is down at the bottom, right? Water is most dense at that temperature. So when water is uh, heated up, if you heat up water, from four degrees all the way to the boiling point, and that's not metric, to the boiling point, which is 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point for water, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit is the boiling point of water. As you increase the temperature, water will expand. And water will expand about 5% its volume. Okay, so as the water is heated, it will expand. Now, this is an issue for us, especially in heating systems. So heating systems, we have to take up that expansion somehow. Does anybody know how we take up expansion in heating systems? Anybody? Overflow tanks? Uh, say that again, louder. Overflow tanks? We have actually, what we have is expansion tanks that take up the um, expansion in boiler systems of the water when it's being heated. Now I'm gonna show you a picture here. All right, I'm just trying to pull it up. Okay, let me share my screen again here. So everybody can see this thing that says hydronic heating on it. Yeah. Okay, so expansion tanks are this little device right here. Okay, this, I don't know if you see my mouse, but this little device right here is a diaphragm expansion tank. So as water is heated, it will expand that water 
And we don't want the expansion or the pressure to rise in the system. So we create these expansion tanks to take up the expansion of that. So this picture shows two different expansion tanks. One is called a cushion tank and it is, that's the one on the right. It is an old school type tank where there's just water and air in there to take up expansion. And the one on the left is a diaphragm expansion tank. And it will take up the expansion. Uh, and I'll show you some more pictures here. This is the cushion tank where the expansion would take place inside this tank because you can compress air, but you can't compress water, right? We can't compress it. So it will expand and will cause some pressurization in the system. And uh, a simple diaphragm expansion tank pictured right here. As you can see, there's a diaphragm located um, right here between the water and the air. There's a separation. There's some pressure gauges on either side. And if I heat up the water, there's a temperature gauge. I'm gonna click this button. And as that water is heated up, the, the water starts to expand and we want the expansion to take place inside the tank. As you can see now, it's at like 15 PSI and not in the system. So that's kind of how an expansion tank works. And as water is being heated, it will expand. Any questions? Is this video somewhere in our content? It is. Now, the only problem, Kristen, is that this is a shockwave file. And most browsers don't support shockwave files anymore. They just stopped. This is flash piece, I guess. And this is an interactive flash piece where um, you could click on all of those things. So I'll just go um, back here. You could click on all of these things and that will show you something. Um, this is under media resources in your course shell. So unless you have a browser that will play a flash or a shockwave file, it will work for you. But if you don't, it won't. It's one of those things, I, I made this so long ago, and now that I want to get it converted over to an HTML5 kind of document, um, it's just, it takes a lot of work and it hasn't been done yet, that's all. So look, I could click on uh, this, this thing, and this is a fin tube radiation, and it shows how the air is moved through it, and it, you know, tells you how to install it and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I yeah, made this a long time ago. It's pretty cool, actually. So anyways, we digress. We're talking about expansion of water. So I'm gonna close this for a second and we're gonna get back. Can you see my screen now with my big cloud on there? Yeah, so that's the expansion of water. So we use expansion tanks to do that and right in here. So when water gets below four degrees C, as it gets below four degrees C, it expands slightly. And my handwriting is not very good this morning. Maybe I had too much wine last night. Got a little bit of shakes. No, that's not true. Okay. It expands slightly as it goes from four degrees C down to the freezing point, which is zero degrees Celsius, or in Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And then when it freezes, when water freezes, it expands again. It expands about 7.5%. It's volume. And it expands enough that it will split copper pipe right down the seam lines. It will split pipe easily and quickly because it expands that much. So when I freeze water, it expands. When I heat water, it expands. When water gets to the boiling point and goes above into steam, 
When water goes to steam, guess what? It expands again. And it expands about 1,700 times its volume. So water expands when you freeze it. It expands when you heat it. And when you make it to steam, it expands again. That shit just expands on everything. It's kind of weird. But as you can see, if you go reverse, as you cool down, as you cool the water down, it will contract a little bit until it gets to the most dense point and then expand again when you freeze it. It's crazy. Any questions? The steam is not 1,700% of its volume, it's 1,700 times its volume? Correct, 1,700 times its volume, okay? It's not a percentage, that is correct. Thank you for that. And right in here on this page 15, unique characteristics of density of water. And we just talked about all of those things right there in a, in a beautiful illustration by Doug. <laughs> Nobody thinks that's a joke, yeah? Okay, any questions? That is the unique characteristics of the density of water. And then that brings us to this table here. As you can see, table one in here lists and says, you are responsible for memorizing densities of water and air in both imperial and metric. <laughs> Right? And we know that air has a mass. We know that water, 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 water. We talked about all of these. Now, these substances right here give us an idea of their mass. Okay? So look at they have all kinds of things and everything is a density. You see it's in cubic feet, cubic feet. Everything has a mass per unit of volume. So that's a table there. You don't have to memorize all those, but you have to memorize water and air. And again, they tried to tell you, look right here, must be memorized. Right, And we wrote down that list, and I hope you're writing down that list, because I wrote it down a few times over my career, and now I remember them forever. Right? Excellent. Any questions? So we're gonna get into what's called relative density. Relative density or sometimes known as specific gravity is the number of times a substance is heavier or lighter than an equal volume of air or water. And those are the standards, okay? Those are the standards that we wrote down already. And for instance, here, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write down a, a couple of ways that we're, we're going to calculate relative density. I'm going to give you a formula triangle here, okay? So if we take the density of an object, and if we divide it by the density of the standards, we will find the relative density. For example, I think at one point we, we discussed how dense I am, right? I think we, we got Doug's density at some point. So Doug's density was about 70 pounds per cubic foot. 
if I recall correctly. I didn't eat dinner last night, so I'm a little lighter than that. So, you know, just saying. So what we do is we take the density of the object. And if we're talking about solid or a liquid, we are going to, oh, geez. We are going to relate it to water. Okay, we're gonna use water as our standard. If we're talking about solids or liquids, we're gonna use water as our standard. So I have to find the standard of water that is in pounds per cubic foot. We know that water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So I will take this, I will divide it by 62.4 pounds per cubic foot and I will get my relative density, which is equal to 1.12. Now you can see the increments of measure that come through here all get canceled off. I, on a relative density number, it's just 1.12. And that means that I am 1.12 times heavier than water. So I'm heavier than water, which means when I get into the swimming pool, I sink to the bottom because I'm heavier than water. So let's do a couple of more according to this. Now, what we need is we need to know our standards. So I'm going to pull over here where I wrote down all of our standards earlier this morning. Uh, I think I put it up here. Where did we put it? There we are. So there's some of our standards. So I wanna have those handy when I do any calculation. So I'm gonna ask you that if I had a gas that has a density of 0 0.51 pounds, per cubic foot, I wanna know the relative density of that gas. So again, using that formula triangle where we take the object's density and we divide it by the standard density is equal to the relative density. So this is the standard. So 0 0.51 pounds per cubic foot. Now this is a gas. So we relate all gases to air. So I will take this gas density and divide it by what air weighs by 0 0.076 pounds per cubic foot. And this gas is 6.7. So it has a relative density of 6.7. It is heavier than air. And if I release this gas into the atmosphere, what is going to happen to that gas? Is it going to go to the ceiling or is it going to sink to the floor? Sinks to the floor. It sinks to the floor. It's heavier than air. It's actually 6.7 times heavier than air. Okay, we'll give you a second to write some of that down. I wanna do a couple of more examples with you. Now, if I had If I had an object that weighed 848 pounds per cubic foot, 
and I wanted to know the relative density of that object. Okay, this is an object, it's a solid something. I would simply take my density of my object divided by the standard, it should be my relative density. So what I do is I divide by my standard. So this is pounds per cubic foot. So I got to look at my standards and I have this one as pounds per cubic foot. So I will divide by 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And this substance should come out to be about 13.6 times heavier than water. So continuing on, if I had water, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, and I wanted to know what the relative density of water is, I divide it by the standard. So water has a relative density of one, as you can see that. So everything is now related to water. It is either heavier or lighter than water. Right, and that's what a relative density or sometimes known as specific gravity means. It's either heavier or lighter than water and we wanna know how many times heavier or lighter it is than water, any object. And now gases, so if I told you that I had 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter of air and I wanted to find the relative density of air, I will simply divide by the standard. So air has a relative density of one. And now everything is either heavier or lighter than air. And it, it's by its relative density. Now I'm gonna tell you one thing here. Gosh, why does that make a circle all the time? Propane gas. So the vapor of propane has a relative density of 1.5. Is this propane gas heavier or lighter than air? Heavier. Heavier. It is 1.5 times heavier than air. So this is the specific reason why you cannot have a propane vehicle in an underground parkade. If you've ever seen an underground parkade, they usually have a sign, no propane vehicles. Because if that vehicle, if that tank sprung a leak, where is all that vapor gonna go? It's gonna continue to go downward <laughs> in the parkade and cause probably a problem. So that is C3H8 is propane. CH4 is methane or natural gas. And natural gas has a relative density of 0 0.6. Is it heavier or lighter than air? Lighter. It's lighter. So if natural gas is uh, released into a room, where is it gonna go? To the ceiling. It's going to go to the ceiling. It's going to go up, right? So each one of these gases that I listed here, in its natural state, are colorless and odorless. We add something to it. We add something smelly to it, and that smelly stuff is called mercaptan. We add mercaptan to these fuel gases so they have an odor so we can tell if it is in the air, right? It's a really, it's a safety thing because gas, these gases in their natural state are colorless and odorless.
So C4H10, which is butane, has a relative density, butane gas has a relative density of two. So it is much heavier than air, twice as much heavier than air. So butane will go to the ground as well. Now, but propane liquid, Propane liquid actually has a relative density of 0 0.51. Propane liquid is lighter than water. It will float on water, propane liquid, but we can't get propane liquid out in the atmosphere unless it is, because it has a boiling point of minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So anything above minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit, propane will boil off into a vapor. We keep it a liquid because we put it under pressure. And we're gonna talk about pressure in the coming weeks. Um, so propane liquid, has a relative density of 0 0.51. So now for example, oh, what the heck? Let me go back into that page here. I don't know what happened there. I pressed the button and it just went out. Okay, so propane liquid, I told you has a relative density of 0 0.51. So if I told you that I had 10 imperial, imperial gallons of propane, I want to know how much does it weigh? And so this is where we can use relative density of the fluid or whatever it is that we're working on to calculate the mass of that fluid. So do we know that there is 10 pounds per gallon for water, right? We know that for a fact. Do we not? Yeah, that's the standard. So if I had 10 gallons of propane, what I'm gonna do, I first have to find the mass equivalent in water. So I'm gonna take my 10 gallons and multiply it by 10 pounds per gallon. So that's gonna give me 100 pounds of what water would be, yes? Water would be 100 pounds. 10 gallons of water would equal 100 pounds. But this propane, is 0 0.51 times heavier than water. So propane, 10 imperial gallons of propane weighs 51 pounds. So you can see how a relative density or specific gravity of a substance, we can calculate the mass of it by relating it to a standard measurement of water. Cool, any questions? So we're going to get back to our relative density um, lecture. I'm going to share my screen here. There we go. So we just kind of calculated how much 10 gallons of propane weighs, which is fantastic. So I'm going to bring you over to my next ILMs here, if I have them embedded in here. I thought I did. 
And there they are down there. Okay, so down here, um, it says right in this top corner up here that densities have units and it's mass per unit of volume, whereas relative density have no units. It's just telling us how many more times heavier a substance is compared to a standard. Okay, so I want to, um, I, I'm going to go through this list a little bit, but I want to give you a little bit a, of a caveat here. So when you have a relative density multiply by the standard. Okay, for example, if I told you that we have a glycol, uh, it has a relative density of 2.35. And I had a tank full of glycol. So that tank is full of glycol. And I'm going to say that this tank is eight feet by two feet, and then it's a big tank, and then it's by three feet. I wanna know the mass of the glycol. So really what we do here is we gotta first find the volume of that container, and I know the volume is length times width times height, equals the volume. So that's going to be eight times three times two, which is 48 cubic feet. And now this glycol is 2.35 as a relative density. So I have to find out how much 48 cubic feet of water will weigh first. So we're going to multiply that by 62.4 pounds in a cubic foot. So if that box or that container was full of water, it would weigh 2,995.2 pounds if it was water but I told you it was glycol and the glycol is 2.35 times heavier than water. So this, this container, the glycol in that container weighs 7,038.72 pounds. So you can see this little caveat up top here. So when you have when you have a relative density, multiply. So I had a relative density and I multiplied. But first, I had to find the mass of a water equivalent of that volume. So I find the mass of the water, and then that liquid is 2.35 times heavier than water. Cool. All right. Give you a second to write that down if you're still writing. Now, I want to give you another little hint here, and I'll put that down here. When you want a relative density, divide, 
I, I spelled that wrong. Divide by the standard. For example, if I had an object that weighed 3,500 kilograms per cubic meter, and I wanted to know the relative density of that object, I will simply divide by the standard of water, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So this object is 3.5 times heavier than water. So I'm going to go back to this list in your ILM here. And now this is a table of relative densities. Now this table, as you can see, air is one because everything is relative to that standard of air. Um, as we go down to stuff that we want to know, look at hydrogen sulfide is 1.189 hydrogen sulfide is heavier than air. All right. Has anybody got their H2S alive ticket? A few people. Okay, make sure you know where that windsock is if you're working on a plant that has H2S. So you know which way the wind is blowing because H2S is a deadly gas and if you're on a plant and you see your fellow coworker fall down and pass out and you're at an H2S plant, I would suggest you run and not help that person. That person may already be dead. It's really sad, but true. Um, look at down here, lead is 11.4 times heavier than water. Mercury, is 13.6 times heavier than water. So mercury is pretty darn heavy. Here we have propane gas, 1.5. We, we, we already figured that out. Propane sinks when it's released in air. Propane liquid, they have it as 0 0.5, but it kind of should be 0 0.51. Uh, I think to be a little more accurate, but 0.5 is, is right there. Um, water is given a one because everything is now relative or related to the mass of water. And now on that, oh, and now on this sheet, it says, in some cases, it's easier to recall a density rather than the imperial density or metric density. Okay, so it just kind of gives you an overview of what relative density is and how to calculate. Do we have any questions? Can you memorize relative densities? Uh, you should know, no, not really. A couple of those, I would, I would say propane gas, propane liquid, because we use it. Methane gas, uh, not methane liquid, but methane gas. We don't use methane as a liquid too much. I mean, liquid natural gas is kind of making inroads. It's just the infrastructure is only basically on ships, um, that sort of thing. Uh, mercury, you should know the relative density of mercury for sure, air for sure. Okay. So a few of those, and, and I have already mentioned them.
And then that brings us to a little bit of a summary around relative densities. So relative densities of solids and liquids always compared to water. Relative densities of gases are always compared to air. So Kristen, here it is. Relative densities of mercury, methane, propane should be memorized. 